If you are sitting on the beach and you're hungry and all of a sudden a big wind blows in and your ice comes crashing into shore and you look out and you see this view, these are harp seals. This particular photograph was taken a couple years ago off the coast of Canada. Uh, today the harp seal population is over four million and that's with a extremely active program to eradicate the harp seal. And I think if I were a Paleolithic hunter and I was sitting on the beach and these things floated in, I'd say, um, let's eat. <laughs> Another expectation of the Bradley and Stanford transatlantic peopling model is that Solotrian and Clovis sites should display a clear connection to open ocean environments and resources. At La Riera Cave in eastern Asturias, a spatially limited excavation in the peripheral remnant of this important site revealed significant evidence of early Solotrian exploitation of coastal and estuarine resources. Of the 16 thin Solotrian levels, five yielded more than 500, two of them more than 1,000, identifiable marine mollusks, almost all large limpets. Other Solotrian sites in the same area, as well as in Cantabria province, notably Altamira, are also known to contain abundant littoral shellfish. The La Riera Solotrian levels also produced small numbers of salmon and trout, but no oceanic fish. Two seal flipper phalanges were found in one La Riera Solotrian level and one in another. These join a single flipper phalanx from the Solotrian of Altamira. There are no cetacean remains in the Cantabrian Solotrian, just a few in one Magdalenian level in Santa Catalina Cave on the present shore of Vizcaya which the excavator attributes to scavenging, which is also the best explanation for the seal bones. La Riera, and many other nearby Solotrian sites in eastern Asturias, and Altamira in Cantabria are located about 9 to 10 kilometers from the 7,120-metre isobath, which is where the shore would have been during the last glacial maximum, a two-hour walk. Large quantities of edible mollusks were carried back to these sites but no ocean fish or marine mammal remains of any significance. In precisely the only area where Solotrian people were making, unfluted, concave bay spear points, the surviving sites were closest to the planoglacial shore. Yet there is no evidence of seafaring, including no boat images in rock or portable art, marine mammal hunting or deep sea fishing. While it is true that seals were represented in cave art a possible probable Solotrian age in Kosker, which also has Auk images, Nerja and La Pileta, these are Mediterranean sites and there is no evidence of seal hunting or deep sea fishing there, either. Some Solotrian people no doubt were aware of seals and whales, which can be seen, dead or alive, along the shore, but they did not hunt them. Evidence of seafaring in the far smaller and easier Mediterranean appears at the very end of the Upper Paleolithic at such sites as Nerja, Andalusia, and Frankthi, Greece, about 6,000 years after the Solotrian. What happened in the tropical waters of Indonesia tens and even hundreds of thousands of years ago, namely the peopling of Sahel and Flores, is simply irrelevant to the Ice Age North Atlantic. Indeed, it is also in the Magdalenian of France that one finds numerous images of seals and fish in rock and portable art. Several of the seal images are far from the Atlantic shore, but seals are known to have swum far up many of the rivers that were teeming with salmon until recent times. Salmon, together with pike, remains can be quite abundant in many Magdalenian sites of Cantabrian Spain and southwest France, often associated with antler harpoons or possible gorges but not ocean fish and not in the Solotrian. It is worth recalling that during the last glacial maximum, which corresponds exactly to the time of the Solotrian techno-complex, the human range in Western Europe had contracted to southern France and the Iberian Peninsula. By approximately 25,000 carbon-dated years before present, people had been forced to abandon Wales, southern England, Belgium, Germany and northern France, where they had lived before, during the Gravechen. Southern Britain would not be recolonized until around 12,500 carbon-dated years before present. There is no evidence, despite the presence of some other mammals that people lived in Ireland, even in the unglaciated south, until around 9,000 carbon-dated years before present. So where on the ice-free shores of the southern British Isles, is the evidence of supposed marine mammal hunting Solotrians navigating the eastern waters of the North Atlantic? As for the use of marine resources in Clovis, 
Cannon and Meltzer reviewed all occurrences of faunal remains in Clovis and Clovis Age sites across North America, and of those only two, Aubrey and Shawnee Menacing produced reliable evidence of the use of an animal that lived on, around, or in, the water. In both cases, the remains were fish, species unidentified, though, as each site is more than 160 kilometers from the present coast, it seems certain neither is a marine fish. There is no evidence from any of the Clovis or Clovis age sites nearer the coast for the use of marine resources fish or mammal. If the earliest North Americans were direct descendants of Solotrian marine mammal hunters and fishermen, there is no evidence of that adaptation, or that they continued that tradition upon arrival. On the assumption that Solotrian groups were hunters of marine mammals and other resources, which of course we believe is factually in error, Bradley and Stanford provide what they describe as informed speculation about the nature of the North Atlantic resources and how Solotrian groups may successfully have crossed the North Atlantic. Their discussion of sea surface and sea edge productivity is interesting but, at best, debatable. The optimistic, but largely undocumented, claims for an Eden-like North Atlantic fed by rich upwelling of seafloor ooze, with melting icebergs sailing eastward along warm gulf waters, at the very least need to be measured against the actual geological and sedimentary record in the seafloor of Heinrich events, LGMC surface temperatures and the changes in North Atlantic deep water production and thermohaline circulation and the effect of all these, and other, variables on biological productivity, especially that of marine mammals. Which is a great point. Luckily, two oceanographers did just that. Karen Wesley and Justin Dix wrote, The Solitary and Atlantic Hypothesis, A View from the Ocean. One current hypothesis for the Pleistocene peopling of the Americas invokes a dispersal by European hunter-gatherers along a biologically productive order situated on the edge of the sea ice that filled the Atlantic Ocean during the last glacial maximum. Critical paleo-oceanographic data underpinning this hypothesis demonstrates that the hypothesized migration was unlikely. Winter sea ice extended down to around 45 to 50 degrees north at maximum. During summer, the northwest European margin was seasonally ice-free almost to 80 degrees north, with rare excursions down to around 60 to 65 degrees north and quasi-permanent ice restricted to the northeast Canadian and east Greenland coasts. Winter ice only persisted for one to three months each year across most of the North Atlantic. Further important features to note are a broad ice-free channel inferred for the Central Atlantic and that the Bay of Biscay, on average, experienced winter sea ice for less than one month per year. In short, the remarkable seasonality of the last glacial maximum North Atlantic contrasts with the oft-assumed concept of a perennially ice-covered ocean. The improved time resolution of recent deep-sea records has also allowed greater insight into the pattern of paleo-oceanographic change over time. In this instance, the majority of the evidence shows that the coldest conditions in the North Atlantic did not occur during the last glacial maximum as previously believed, but during two rapid events on either side of it. Heinrich Events During these brief intervals, sea surface temperatures fell drastically and the North Atlantic was filled by ice. However, this did not take the form of a continuous sheet of sea ice, but was comprised of massive discharges of icebergs from the North American and European ice sheets reaching as far south as 40 degrees north. Even if it were argued that the hypothesized dispersal took place during these events, there is still the obstacle that the Atlantic sea ice was composed of discontinuous icebergs rather than a largely continuous and flat mass of ice, a platform less suited to the aggregation of dense concentrations of marine mammals. In addition, these were drifting south and east with the dominant wind and ocean currents the most southerly modern extremes of harp seal congregations on ice are located in the waters of the Gulf of St. Lawrence and off northeast Newfoundland. These areas presently have ice cover two to four months per year. These facts lead one to question whether an intensively ice-based marine mammal hunting subsistence strategy could actually have developed in the Bay of Biscay given its lower ice concentrations. And that was the proverbial nail on the Solotrian Clovis coffin.